Yeah. Uh, and I get it. I stopped a long time ago, but man, for a while there, I was right there with everybody else. I, you know, I hadn't hardly played the game at all, but I was fascinated by all the shit that seemed all the shit. to be. Yeah. It was so cool. And we're 140 pages in and almost nothing's happened. It's, it is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's not ridiculous. What's that? Hey there, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to Pixel It. My name is Kevin. With me, as always, is Phil. And today, we are reading, recapping, and reviewing our our white whale, so to speak. Uh, oh Lord! It is it is a book that um, there are some some lost episodes of uh, yeah. from from Those several have years be ago. Somewhere, <laughs> uh, it's probably on my hard drive or or somewhere. Um, yeah, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, The Silver Eyes. Um, yeah. See, because what you kids at home don't know is that Kevin and I attempted this podcast five years ago, maybe six. Uh, uh, yeah, something like that, maybe. Because it was um, back when I was working for Scuff, so it yeah. Was, so this book, the book came out in what, 2015? Yeah, something like that. I think it was relatively new when we first started talking about this. I want to say uh, it was 2016. Like 20... Yeah. Okay. So I think it might have been 2017, which is five years ago. Yeah, that Holy sounds about shit. right. Yeah. Five years. Yeah. 2017 was five years ago. Yeah. Me and Kevin came up with the idea of let's do a podcast where we read and review and talk about uh, adaptations of video games into novels, and we said, you know what, everyone likes right now because it is twenty seventeen. Five Nights at Freddy's. It's, it's twenty seventeen. Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah, it's the perfect. Scott thing Cawthon to start was with. top of the world. Top you know, of the world. He hadn't, <laughs> he hadn't <laughs> been discovered to be a hardcore Republican yet. Not, not yet. <laughs> not yet. I don't. Th- I think if anyone had done a little bit of homework, you could have figured it out. But still, you probably could have figured it out. Yeah, you could have figured it out. But and we said FNAF is perfect to start with because you know we'll we'll it's it's a popular game it's a popular topic holy shit they made a books a book about it they've got a whole series going at the time even then i think there was like two maybe at the time yeah i and, think there's five total uh yeah books that came out and we said let's start with this and we started reading it and we got one episode in the bank and did we, we got two, I want to say, episodes in the bank? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. A- and we did and then we just kind of, you know how it is when you start a project with a friend and it just wasn't meant to be and you stop bugging the other one about when are we going to get together and record yeah, the next yeah. episode? It was, it was just like, I don't want to. Do I just, that. we just didn't care. Um, but we care now. <laughs> we care now. I think I think we wanted to make sure we could get through a year of this show before we were going to before give it we try. we turned our attention back to Mr. Oh Freddie Fazbear. God. Oh my God! Yeah, the silver eyes. This is, the, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin couldn't have put it better. This is our white whale. This <laughs> this is this is this is it, it, either either we get over this hump. In the next three episodes, or this show is gone forever. Forever. And we, and we shake hands and, and agree to a gentleman's truce uh, that, that, n- that nothing could defeat us. Not, not Dead Space, nor, nor Infinity Blade, nor, nor Bloodborne, but FNAF. Five Nights FNAF. at Freddy's, The Silver Eyes, the silver defeated eyes. us. Defeated. We're going to yep. find out. We're going to find out. Holy shit. So uh, to get us started, I'm going to just give a little primer on Five Nights at Freddy's. If you've been, I don't know how you're listening to this show and not aware of what Five Nights at Freddy's is, because it is probably (laughs) outside of Minecraft, it is probably the most famous indie game to ever be made. I would say it's certainly the most, I mean, possibly the most famous horror game period. Most, uh, but yeah, by far the most famous horror game period. Not uh, if we're, if we're talking about people's knowledge, knowledge of it outside of the gaming sphere. Right. Because yeah. that's the one thing is, is five nights at Freddy's has a very big influence on people who are not 
big gamers. Uh, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. They, it, it, more of the the Fortnite and the the Minecraft crowd. You know, the the, the people who don't play a lot outside of their everyday games. Um, yeah. Uh, so like my my daughter is very aware of of what Five Nights at Freddy's is and she's watched videos and she's never played the game. And that's kind of where mm-hmm. the, the the game is in in the zeitgeist. So it was, it was released in 2014. It's a point and click horror game where you basically just have to uh, divide your attention between a bunch of security cameras to make sure that um, these uh, haunted animatronics don't break into your office and murder you. And that's pretty right. much it. Um, and we were talking before the show how, you know, the the book has, uh, and we're going to get into the book, the book has a lot of fat on it. And the game, but the game itself is very, very lean. And that's Absolutely. why it became so popular. There is There is very little there that doesn't need to be there. Um, it's very tight the everything about it is is very specifically done um now scott cawthon who is the creator of the game um he made the game after being he he got turned on to it because he was making these games that were i want to say they were like christian uh he did pc games and they were they didn't they weren't going so well because everyone was really creeped out by the animal mascot characters that he would introduce into them they looked right. terrifying so with that information in mind he 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 took that and he made five nights at freddy's with these terrifying animatronic dead-eyed and <laughs> animals um as as the antagonists um now, since then, I mean, the, the franchise has become this massive thing. Uh, there's there's a bajillion games. Uh, I, I want to say there's like upwards of six in the main Five Nights at Freddy's. Yeah. And then there's a bunch of spinoff games like Security Breach, which is like a uh, an actual first person like horror game where you, you're walking around a uh, a a mall or pizzeria or something like that, that that's littered with animatronics. Um, and in, I guess within the last couple of years, Scott Cawthon has, I think it was last year, Scott Cawthon was outed as a, a, a hardcore Republican donate donator uh, of funds um, to a lot of people who, uh, to a lot of candidates who are an, the antithesis of the fans basically um who yeah. who kind of who uh, a lot of a lot of gen z people are uh, a lot more left leaning um and they they grew up with these games and when the, it, it was almost like a betrayal when they found out that Scott Cawthon <laughs> Scott Cawthon was donating to these republican candidates who uh would rather they didn't exist in the way that they do um so right. Uh, Cawthon announced his retirement. He's not in the scene anymore. He's he basically left Five Nights at Freddy's to some some people and like hey you know the co- the company handles it. He doesn't he's not involved in the day to day anymore, and he is retired and spending yes. time with his family. And that's pretty much the overall summary of of Five Nights at Freddy's and its cultural impact basically from 2014 to to now. Um, it's it's kind of a big one. Um, right, <laughs> uh, Phil. Did you did you look into uh, yeah. aside from Scott Cawthon, who is listed as an author he, on this? Well, and, yeah, yeah. He's he's listed as the author on this and every last one of the Freddy books that have come out from this novel series, which is the, this is the first entry into to all kinds of smaller pieces. His name always appears on it, which makes it feel um, a little bit like a Tom Clancy sort of thing. Sure, you know? yeah, yeah. It's his branding more than anything else. It's unclear how much of the writing for this book, for example, that he actually did. Right. Um, I'm hesitant to say that he did nothing and that it was just ghostwritten uh, by Miss Kira Breed Reasley, which uh, we'll talk about in a second. Um 
because uh, you know, as as you hinted at with his his games, the games are very lean, uh, but the lore behind them is very elaborate. And if you believe people like uh, the YouTuber Matt Pat and other uh, you know associated uh, uh, personalities online who have done quite a bit of research and digging and that sort of thing that this this whole thing is this vast woven tapestry um of uh, of a bizarre and violent and strange story that takes place over over several decades and i do i think personally i think that yeah there is there is an aspect of that that he is absolutely responsible for i also think Cawthon is probably uh, a smart enough guy that he saw with the internet and people reading very heavily into certain aspects of the game that he maybe didn't think about, but instead of going, uh, no, not really. He went, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and just kind of worked that into it over time. Um, it's tough to say, uh, but it has absolutely become a, a, an absolute rat king of lore where everything is just smushed together uh, uh, in bizarre ways. It's still not clear. Uh, and it's actually one of the things that me and, and a lot of people, you know, your your kid included, for example, that never really played much of the games, uh, but, uh, but absolutely know a ton about the lore, simply because it really was fascinating. Uh, so on one hand, I don't know how much Scott wrote of this book. On the sure. other hand... I, I, I'm 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 not willing to go completely on the Tom Clancy route, although it does it does feel a little like that. We do yeah. know that for this series of novels, he did have a ghostwriter, or not. A, I don't know if you can call it a ghostwriter if they appear on the cover. Uh, but Miss Kira Breed Reesley, um, who is a young writer, uh, she came out of Columbia, uh, which is you know you heard of it. Uh, <laughs> she's got quite the pedigree. When it comes to her entire bibliography, however, you are hard pressed to find anything but Five Nights at Freddy's uh, novels and books. Uh, she is a uh, gr- uh, she is a credited as a writer for all of the novels, as far as I can tell, uh, for the graphic novels that came of it. Um, she seems to be, and and as a result, has become a New York's best New York Times bestseller. Uh, right. because of this. Uh, yeah. But I think this is really it. I think this is what she does now. Uh, yeah. Or if not... There's not much... There's not much... I, I When I Googled her, I, I didn't find anything else. Yeah, yeah. There's not much to it uh, beyond that. I do not blame her in the slightest. Uh, if I had a, a sweet gig like this one, uh, I probably would just focus on smaller projects that maybe wouldn't get as much attention. <laughs> After right. after I you know cashed my FNAF paycheck, same for Scott. By the way, he retired. He didn't need the drama. He didn't need everyone knowing he was a Trump voter. Uh, and he he said, "I'm retiring. I've got uh, I've got more money than God. I might as well." Yep. Good move, my friend. Good move. Yeah. Yeah. He can, I don't blame him. He so can keep those those beliefs in his in his house, and uh, yeah. you know he can donate Just, to Ted Cruz all he wants now. Jesus Christ! Uh, the the <laughs> real, the real terrifying animatronic uh, in in our in America's closet. Uh, those are some dead eyes. <laughs> those are some dead eyes. But what we have here, basically, that means is we have two writers whose entire careers are centered completely around the Five Nights at Freddy franchise. Yeah, which makes you wonder uh, how this book is so fucking boring. Uh, so far. <laughs> without 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 jumping the gun, <laughs> without jumping the gun, uh, it there's is a, a reason it, that it that it, this is our second try in this five is our second years. Try. Reading so this book. here's here's the wild thing, and just a, a <laughs> little uh, something I noticed is that this book has, sits at four and a half stars on Amazon. Sure, um, with over with nearly eight thousand reviews, so. So in terms of 4. in terms of seven on uh, yeah, Goodreads, yeah. In terms of popular opinion, uh, this book is good, quote unquote. Um, it is well received, and yes. we are the we're going to be the assholes on this series. If you are a Five Nights at Freddy's fan and you like this book, um, 
that is not our experience with it thus far. We have re- we're a third of the way into the book, and uh, Phil and I have done. This is our second time doing it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't easy either time. Um, if you are a Five Nights at Freddy's fan and you are a fan of this book, um, and you don't want to hear us talk negatively about the book, this might be a series for you to skip. Uh, but if you want us to get into the nitty gritty of what the issues are with this book, aside from the fact that it seems to have been written just to connect lore together, it feels like it was just put out to throw to to scatter shot some little bits of lore uh, mm-hmm. for for the for the FNAF universe. It was it was written like written specifically for Matt Pat. It was like, yeah, yeah, it does <laughs> pop up from time to time in those videos. And, and and Kevin's absolutely right. You know, as much as we have, you know, uh, uh, twisted the knife a little bit when it came to books in this uh, show that we didn't care for, I always am, I, I, I find it important to point out that, yeah, we do make fun. We do have a lot of laughs at, at sometimes these books expenses, but it comes from a valid place of criticism. Uh, we've talked to the authors of books that we have made fun of. Uh, sure. You know, we're not we're not afraid. Of, we're not hiding how we feel about this. So I I invite you if you love FNAF unequivocally uh, to hear us out. Let me put it that yeah. way. And we haven't finished this book, by the way. As of today, yeah, we have not it, finished it, this book. It, it might be. We, this this book might turn it all around. It's just it killed our podcast Absolutely. once before, so I think we're on a. <laughs> it's it's yeah, personal, uh, god damn it! It's per it's personal. It's, uh, <laughs> my name is goddamn Ishmael. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just call me Quique. Uh, so anyway, um, we're gonna get into it. Chapter one starts with a flash forward. Fucking hate it. Um, <laughs> We're off to a good start. <laughs> um, I don't. All right. So my problem with the flash forward is that it removes tension be, uh, up until the point that, you know, exactly this scene is going to happen for mm-hmm. the character in the flash forward. Um, Why don't you uh, real quick? Could you tell could you tell our audience at home what a, what a flash forward is just in case maybe. They OK, so so a flash forward is uh flashbacks super common writing trope uh a flash forward is less used um the most the one i like to point to the most is um which i thought was actually kind of a neat one was the third mission impossible movie opens with a flash forward um kind of like setting the stakes for the characters and then jumps back into present time so a flash forward is is it's not foreshadowing. It's literally showing a scene from later in the story before jumping back into present time. It's not yeah. used as often because um, it's less of a natural writing concept. Like flashbacks are natural because memories exist and you can think yeah. back to something. Um, yeah. Flash forward. A flash forward is a little bit more of like a, a prognostication uh, it's fortune telling. Right. Um, yeah. So it's it it has a little bit like a, of a less natural existence within the uh, a linear story. Uh, that being said, I don't dislike flash forwards, but as a rule, they they're as good as the way they are used. But in a horror story, my issue with a flash forward is that a flash forward removes tension. Um because you now know that this is nothing is going to necessarily happen to the character in the flash forward when they are not in that specific circumstance. Mm-hmm. Um, so it Unle- opens with unless a flash you're forward. planning on doing something weird with it, which this book is not. This book does not seem to be planning on doing something weird with it. Um, yeah. The book opens with the flash forward. Foxy is uh it's foxy right that's the the uh, yes it was foxy yeah yeah foxy is uh chasing our main character charlie through uh freddy's pizzeria uh with his hook and she's trying to hide and then he finds her and the hook comes down towards her 
and we uh that's where it ends it it cuts into present day <laughs> that's it that's it it's a cliffhanger on a flash forward fucking hell <laughs> um anyway uh, um <laughs> This is going to be a tough one, guys. This is going to be a tough one, guys. Um, and I will, I, I'll get this out of the way. There are some... This is a very uneven book. There are parts where it is written and it's like, okay, the writer has skill. And then parts of it where it's like, uh, it's so frustratingly structured and paced um yeah. that it it loses me so we don't jump to the present day charlie is arriving in hurricane utah um and one of my least favorite things about this book is that there's a lot of uh description words that are just thrown in like she smiles wryly at the sign saying hurricane sure. utah like f- fucking okay um i don't understand what that means Especially because the next sentence is about how as soon as she passes a sign, she has anxiety. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's we'll, there. It's like a conflicting emotion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's yeah. They, we get a lot of those moments where, um, in this in this chapter, basically, we're going to meet this group of kids. They are kids. They're they, one of them describes himself as being seventeen. I believe. Yeah, they're, they're seventeen. 17 yeah, yeah. Uh, so they're, they're kids and for all of the time we're going to spend with them in the next few chapters, we learn very little about them. And these moments that Kevin's describing, like, yeah, we're going to, she, she, she smiles wryly at a sign and then starts suddenly feeling full of anxiety. So it's, it's like, well, then what the fuck was the, it's just, we're not suggesting... There's adverbs that just get dropped into these sentences that just right. feel really weird. Right. Um, <laughs> but I'm not going to I'm not going to hit on, hit on any uh, on them for too long. That th- it happens a lot and that one was the first one to really stick in my stick in my craw, so to speak. Sure. Um, so we get an exposition dump and she's remembering the specifics that she's coming back to town 10 years after her friend Michael died. Um, because his parents uh, want to do some sort of scholarship announcement, basically. Yeah. And uh, it's never explicitly stated, but it's 1995 um, because uh, Michael's death was 1985. Um, okay. So it's great. She drives through town. She goes to her old house and we find out that her aunt Jen has like pay- finished paying off the mortgage. This is the house that she lived in with her dad. Um, we, from context clues, we assume that her dad is deceased. Um, there's not a lot of, even through the chapters we've read so far, there's not much discussion as to why or, or how or anything like that. It's just kind of like referenced that she lives with her aunt Jen and And her dad uh, has disappeared. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, we get a lot, of, a lot of very precise descriptions of the house and the room and all that stuff. And it's a lot of it's a lot of time that could be better spent on literally anything else. But <laughs> yeah. we hear that the room has a, is the ceiling of the room is slanted to follow the line of the roof. And like, OK, yeah, no, no, you're no, I want to I want to touch on that because you're absolutely right. <laughs> We, we know about these precise angles of the roof. Uh, we know about the carpet. We know about the, the all of these very tiny, tiny details, which you could admire if we knew any more about our characters. We don't know anything about uh, the aunt, really. We don't know uh, Ch- uh, Charlie, Charlotte, if you will, the, the 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 main character. We will get to know her, but we will not get to know most of her friends nearly as well as we will the architecture of this house. So y'all just yeah. y'all just sit back and enjoy that goddamn house, uh, yeah. because that is that is that is the kind of description the the attention to detail that you are going to have to learn to appreciate. Architecture, not human beings. This is a Frank Lloyd Wright book. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, there's some creepy animatronics in her room, uh, which 
at first she's like, oh, I missed these guys. Um, and then later on in the chapter, when the sun goes down, she's like, oh, fuck, I, I don't like this at all. I don't like these animatronics. I'm, <laughs> I'm sprinting out of the house and, uh, and running to the car, um, which I, I, I mean, I like the fact that it's like hinting at that, that she has two, basically two different, two, uh, two wolves fighting in, inside of her. And one wolf <laughs> is pro animatronics <laughs> and the other one hates them <laughs> right and the other one's a normal person wolf. a normal person who doesn't <laughs> like animatronics because most people don't no it's not exactly. it's not a um it, a unless you're ass. disney yeah unless you're you're knocking it out of the park disney level it's uh i don't think anybody wants to deal with it yeah um, exactly the other one's the uncanny valley loving wolf yeah uh loves him some uncanny valley so <laughs> She drives away from the house. I mean, there's there's not too much. This is this is a bunch of pages, but there's not a lot of specifically interesting or story beat moments. She you know she's she has creepy feelings about her one of the closets in her bedroom, which she has never opened before because it is the, her big girl closet. Um, <laughs> she she doesn't want to go into her dad's workshop. You know, stuff like that. She is she has uh, it's like bad omens. You know, mm -hmm. she has some some bad vibes about this house. Um, so she's gone. She's gone. She's driving down the road and she's going to a diner to meet her friends. Um, and we get introduced to most of the party, most of the main characters that we're going mm -hmm. to be living with for the rest of the story. Um, we got a John. Uh, who is the cool, who's the, the cool Bukowski writing dude. Um, uh -huh. You know, he's, he's going to be a I'm, real mess when he's older. He's going to be a real <laughs> mess when he's older. I'm like adding characteristics to them that aren't in the story. But it, he's <laughs> yeah, like, I was going to say, don't make them more interesting. Like. John has a drinking problem that he's never actually <laughs> um, revealed to anybody that he, the only way he, he can write is when he drinks and he does it. <laughs> He hasn't been the same since the accident. He, he hasn't been the same since the accident. Um, uh, what's that movie? Barfly. Uh, Barfly. Yeah, yeah. That's Barfly. Drink is John, for all John. my friends. All my friends. Uh, that's that's uh, John's favorite movie. Uh, <laughs> it's his aspirational film. It's his aspirational <laughs> film is to be Mickey Rourke and Bar and Barfly. It's Mickey Rourke, right. isn't it? It's Mickey Rourke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pre sledgehammer of plastic surgery, Mickey Rourke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he got his face fucked up from boxing. Right? Is that Wasn't what it that was? It? I didn't know. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was because he went into boxing and he he his face got kind of jacked up from no that. shit oh that explains so much dude that's fucking hilarious i mean hilarious it's it's well, sad yeah, but, yeah, but kind of funny yeah you're right. jesus christ yeah you're right it's not the right word but i just i i think i think most people think that he just got addicted to plastic surgery the way some people yeah do. i think it's i think it has something to do with like he, breaking bones in his face or something like that Holy um shit that's i think insane. i might be totally making this up but i think it was he, went into, he got into boxing and he See, fucked up his you're face. making up you're making a background for these characters in fnaf you're making up background for background Rourke. for mickey Rourke, you know i mean where I'm does it stop to Kevin? making it interesting character backgrounds what can i say <laughs> well so yeah the author isn't so why why shouldn't you so be? carlton uh is the, the the local kid and uh he's the one only one that didn't move out of town after the incident and mm -hmm. um jessica who is pretty um mm -hmm. that's that's yeah. about there no, I mean that's um, literally all they give her. Like she's nice, but they make a point of saying like she's she's nice though. She's not one of those pretty. She's nice. She's not. She's not. She's not like the other pretty girls. She's not like the other pretty girls. She's nice. So you can get that idea out of your head. Uh, yeah. Jesus Christ. Conversation is really is dumb and really long. Um, and I think in my note in they, my notes I just wrote Jesus Christ. Um, 
I, I have yeah. no other details about what they talk about. <laughs> well, they don't really talk about much. They talk about like one's moved to New York and and yeah, obviously the one it's like what behind. they did and and New York is interesting. And yeah, it's it's, it's yeah. And, I, and I'd like to point out here, by the way, we've mentioned this already, but I don't want you to forget these kids are all underage. They're all still in high school. We will not be seeing any of their parents uh, at this point. They will be staying in hotels together alone and unsupervised. Uh, one drove, you know, our main character we know drove far away to come here to be here. Uh, these are minors and they're fully unsupervised and we're just going to roll with that, I suppose. These are high school minors who are going, this is, you know, this story could have gone in a bunch of fascinating ways. <laughs> it really could have. We've I mean, set up here for some before the show started, Phil, you mentioned uh, like if in some way you could compare it to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, structurally. But yeah. uh, things actually happen in it. Right. And, and, and here's the thing. Some would argue too much that that too much it happens in it bloated and you learn too much and it's like you don't need all of this padding we don't to make we an didn't effective need, story we did, like here's the thing is we don't need these characters to have an orgy no well that is it for damn sure we no we one needs no, no one needs one that needs and, it. And, and i'm hoping we don't get to that in this book but but the point is you can make but a valid argument of that. right <laughs> You you can you can make a valid argument for Stephen King's approach being a little too much, uh, yeah. uh, too much information. It's like the other end. It, it's like it and and Silver Eyes are like two ends of the going back to my hometown spectrum, yeah. uh, and creepy shits happening. That's like there's there's too much and not enough. You know, right, right. We we at least, but yeah, and say what you want for. If 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 Stephen King wrote too much, which I, I believe he did, uh, at least we know stuff about our characters uh, beyond just the one who is clearly the main character focus. In the next four chapters, we in this chapter, this is where we should be laying it down. We should be finding out lots of interesting things about all of these characters. Because as you pointed out, Kevin, we're going to be spending this book with these people. So if we need to give a shit about whether they live or die, whether they're in danger or not, this is a great time to tell us a little bit more than <sighs> we don't get anything. It feels kind of like, you know, I, I've read about how um, in, uh, uh, what is that terrible book series? Uh, Twilight. That in Twilight yes. that, that uh, you know, that Stephanie Meyer wrote the lead female protagonist as uh, generically as possible so that young people could put themselves in this person's shoes and, and it could be like them. Um, we can't do that when we've got like four or five main characters we're following around. We need to different. You can still make them kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. What do you want to say? Vanilla. But they need sure. to be in some direction, and and we don't really have a lot of direction for these characters. And me, it's too, yeah. Just give me the fucking Breakfast Club, right? Yeah, exactly. Here's this. He's the gig. She's just the throw brain. on Breakfast Club onto Absolutely. these characters, and I would have been fine. <laughs> I would have been fine. Look, you're reading a FNAF book. We're not expecting you to, you know, reinvent the wheel here. But we need something. We need yeah. something. These and these chapters are too long. These to are very it. long chapters. These are they very are long so chapters. So long. There are multiple scene changes per chapter, um, and it's it's wild how long yeah. some of these chapters get. Um, so they get onto the uh, topic of Freddy's, which and they talk about it with. Here's the other thing: is I have an issue with is I remember being 17 and I remember. Uh, I would never have had as much nostalgia for Chuck E. Cheese right. as these kids have for yeah. Freddy's Pizzeria. Um, because by 17, I would have been too cool for school with that shit. Um, yeah. 
Especially yeah. if, as we find out later, your your last experience with the restaurant is your your best one of your best friends was kidnapped and goddamn murdered. Right. Which I is don't, spoiler un, alert. I, what happened? Spoiler alert. We're gonna get to that in like a chapter or two. But anyway. Right. Um so anyway, they talk about how Freddy's is great. Charlie gets kind of like upset and leaves. She needs some air on the outside, which is the only interesting character moment that we have in the first chapter uh, from any of them is that she actually has like a micro panic attack and she goes outside, yeah. gets some fresh air. And everybody comes out and like, oh, yeah, we we probably shouldn't have, uh, you know, brought it up, blah, blah, blah. And then somehow the conversation gets turned back around to, hey, fuck it. Let's go try to find Freddy's. Um, yeah. And because Carlton has been talking about how there's construction in the area, he really doesn't know what's going on. Um, and they're like, how the fuck do you not know what's going on? And he's like, I don't know. I'm it's, it's on the other side. Of town. Fuck you, John. Right. Um, right. <laughs> Everyone gives him shit because like they're like, you're the guy who still lives here and you don't know what's going on. And he goes, I don't fucking go over there. <laughs> so they go to it. That's the end of chapter one. Yeah. Chapter two. There are is a page and a half talking about this building and it's a fucking mall. Yeah. Like and the word mall is not used anywhere. No. And it is it drove me insane that there is a <laughs> they're it, talking about how weird the building is. And be like, it's just a mall. It's a and mall. Later in the book, it's just referred to as we go back to they went back to the mall but because it was just yeah. a fucking mall. Like we we know what a mall looks like. Like right. they go to the mall that was like it was just never completed. But <laughs> it's, mm. it's an abandoned mall. That's, it's an abandoned mall. That's great. Just say that. Everyone has has context for that in this country. We we know what you're talking about. So much time is spent on talking about how this building is weird and and and, and it's it's creepy looking and like it's just an abandoned mall. We don't need Arch to architecture, not character development, Kevin. We, architecture is not character development. We don't need to spend <laughs> that much time on what the building looks like. God. Um just say it's a it's an abandoned mall. There's an entire aesthetic of like that predates this book being written of people like doing the urban exploration into abandoned yeah. malls. And it's like, huge know on the Internet. It's so. a huge thing. It's a yeah. big thing. We get it. This book came out in 2017. We get it. Or 2016. Yeah. We, I and think its popularity we has everything to do with the Internet. So yeah. culturally, we understand that abandoned malls are creepy. So. Yeah. You know, we got it. We got it. You can. We got you, it. You can. That you got a c cultural touchstone shortcut right there. Uh, right. So easy. Make it. Make um, it easier so, on yourself. But that's the thing is, it it distracted me for so long because I didn't know it was a mall until we got into the building, and it's like they get into the food court, and the 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 food court. It's it's just like hand waved away. Like, right. of course, there's a food court because it's a mall. They're like, well, you haven't said it's a mall. You just said they, it's they, a weird building. <laughs> I, I I know exactly what you mean, because I was in the same place where I was like, it is weird how they're described. This is an odd place. What is this? And they and they break in and they're like, you know, there are the different storefronts facing each other across the hall from each other. And I went, it's weird. It's kind of like. An enclosed market of some sort. It's a, oh my God, it's a mall. It's just a mall. <laughs> just say it's a fucking mall. It's a mall that was like never finished or something like right. that. Right, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's all. <laughs> so they're running, they're, they basically, they get inside because there's a, there's a pile of gravel leaning against one of the walls that they can like use as a ramp to get up into one of the, the windows and they, they jump down and they start exploring. Um, and they have a little like brief moment where they have to hide from a security guard who is, yeah. you know, you know, uh, buildings like that that are under construction or in complete construction, they, yeah, they tend to have security because they try not to, you know, kids get weird. It was, it was yeah. still the tail end of the satanic panic, you know, I'm sure oh, in absolutely. 1995, I'm sure there would be some metal heads that would go in there and fuck around making oh, it yeah, look like there was an animal sacrifice in there. 
Absolutely. Uh, which would be which would cool and 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 that would be that would be really cool and that would rule and that if they did that. But yeah. there's a security guard and they probably shouldn't. They just we be, this is this is the first moment of um a danger any yeah. kind of danger uh that is just glossed over and and the and and the claws are taken out of it. Uh which is such a strange choice in a book that's meant to be scary. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we're going to see a lot of that. We're going to see a lot of that uh, where the where the claws where it's declawed before there's really any uh, effort for it to be scary. Um, yeah. So they the security guard passes and uh, uh, one of the characters, I think it's Jessica, figures out that there's like the, the the where they are in the mall. It's like this wall shouldn't be here. It should be further over. Mm hmm. And they kind of put it together that there's like a this wall is built around something, and then they they find a uh, an inscription on uh, a, a opening where it's something that uh, Marla had written about Carlton on the wall, and they're like, "This is Freddy Fazbear's," and they open, you know, they feel around and they find a door into, and wouldn't you know it. The mall is built around Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, uh, yeah. and it's still intact on the inside. Now, I the first time we read this book, I was like, "That's fucking stupid," and now <laughs> I'm like, "I'm I'm thinking about it." And they might get to this later in the. First of all, the characters are not are not appropriately weirded out that that happened. Like, yeah, that's, it's a ch it's an odd choice. So yeah, um, but also. Just having one of the characters point out, be like, oh, like, I've heard about this. There's, there's, um, I think there's like a mall somewhere. It's either in England or something like that, where there's this, there, basically they had the entire block except this old woman's house. And the old woman was like, it's like the, it's actually the story of Up. Uh, the the yeah. story of Up is borrowed from this, where the the old woman's like, "No, I'm not going to sell," and they basically the entire like block except is just except for her property is like carved around yeah. <laughs> and built yeah. around her property. And so what I I was like I was thinking like, okay, well maybe they just didn't have like they couldn't figure out the ownership stuff with the pizzeria. So they just built around it. That's like my head cannon now. Maybe they'll right. eventually get to that, or maybe they'll just ignore it. I don't know. Um, I, I feel like you've got with with how much weird, quasi not mystical, but like Resident Evil puzzle style shit has been built into the world of FNAF through all of this internet lore and. And mystery unweaving and stuff like that. That there has to be some kind of strange, like it, like they're burying it. They're burying this place. I hope that it has some sort of context to that. Like we're like this is a bad place, and we've got to like just encase it uh, yeah, in, to in keep this the thing evil from getting out. Right? Yeah, something like that. I I, I do not know yet, obviously, but I, I fingers yeah. crossed that we get something cool like that. So they go inside Freddy's, they look around, they have some memories, and they hear a music box playing somewhere, um, which is a reference to, I believe, Freddy plays from a music box right before he mm -hmm. kills you, I want to say. Um, it's it's the it's usually the tune that's playing when uh, you get to 6 a.m. Okay. Uh, you get a little music box. Uh, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Uh but yeah, you 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 get that. So I, I, it's supposed to be like a good thing to hear that. So I don't know why we're using it for creepy on me. It is creepy, don't get me wrong. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I haven't yeah. played those games in a long time, so. Um so they're looking around. They get to the private birthday room, which is where Foxy's stage is, and uh, you know, Charlie starts having a little panic attack because she has some unresolved issues around Foxy. Um, I think we all do. I think we all do. Um, <laughs> why would you make the hook hand sharp? What the fuck? I don't um, know. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> 
I'm not an animatronics designer. I don't. I don't know how these yeah, things maybe, work. I don't know what the, the secret handshake is. It's, maybe the eye can tell it's dull, and that really yeah. breaks the immersion. You, you just gotta. You really. You gotta. You know, in order to create the illusion of a threat, you have to create a threat. So <laughs> <laughs> it can't be an illusion. It has to be a real oh, threat. Has to be um, real. Writers who use subtext are cowards. <laughs> I know, I know who writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. Um, <laughs> so uh, Carlton, meanwhile, knocks over some pans in the kitchen, and everybody freaks out. And then they're like, "All right, well, we got to go because the security guard probably heard that." And they run out, and they run out to the parking lot, and they they got the giggles, tee hee 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 hee, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and uh, that's the end of basically them in them all and, and jessica and charlie uh they're staying together in a motel room so yeah. jessica is going to drive uh jessica and charlie drive to the motel and they get there and they have some girl talk um the yes they do the, they do just what this it's, book needed just what this book needed <laughs> uh charlie says uh asks jessica about a guy that jessica was seeing charlie asks the following question did you get to know his soul? Um, Which, and I what hi- the fuck, man? highlighted that and like, that doesn't seem like a word. That doesn't seem like a question. Charlie, who the vibe we get from Charlie is like, she's semi tomboyish kind of. Yeah. Not that we get any specific vibe from any of the characters. It just didn't seem like it would come out of her mouth like that. Um, yeah, I have to ask, it, it was this. Do you think this was like coded like for did you lose your V card or something oh, like that? Like, yeah, yeah. Did you did you did did you fuck him? Um, did he did he did he go down to pound town? Is that you know like <laughs> you can't yeah. say that because kids like this series. Yeah. Um so and then Jessica basically is like, oh yeah, uh he was a poet and I read his poetry and it was so bad that I had to tell him it was bad and I I left with his book of poetry in my hands. And uh next time I saw him, he was wearing a uh a sweater vest and had become like a finance major. And I was like, Jesus Christ. And then uh, and then Jessica says, I did him a favor. And <laughs> that's that's the pro-capitalism messaging that is <laughs> embedded in the Five Nights at Freddy's franchise right there. Right is, there. Is, 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 is uh, the banker is worth more than the poet. Than the poet. And I dare you, good people listening, uh, to... Uh, counter that argument because it's an easy one to counter. Uh, fuck it, you know. <laughs> Give it a try. I I I also like. Um, yeah, I, I I just I I can't even. Oh, uh, this is it's a rough I, scene. I, it's a it's just look. It's a bold choice as a writer to write about finding out that somebody is a bad writer. And so you neg them into becoming uh, a finance wizard. Uh, it's it's bold to put that in your shitty book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> One would not want to invite comparisons. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Dangerous um, business. Dangerous business inviting comparisons. Um, I, for one, am against it. I try not to invite comparisons whenever I can. Yes. Um, because it's, it's, uh, it makes me feel icky inside. So, um, this conversation I, goes, I also, goes on forever. Yeah. I, I, well, I just real quick want to point out that I also, uh, try to avoid, uh, inviting comparisons. You guys let us know if I invite comparisons better or worse than Kevin does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a fucking, I can't believe I fucking interrupted you to do that stupid joke. <laughs> And you know what? I'm leaving it in. I'm not editing that one out. <laughs> I deserve it. I deserve it. <laughs> oh, oh, God. God. Uh, the 
conversation goes on forever. Um, there's a really weird moment where Jessica talks about going to a funeral parlor and how it's an old timey funeral parlor with the casket uh, open. And I yeah. was like, like any funeral parlor I've ever that, been to. That's just a funeral parlor, man. That's I just a funeral parlor. I don't. I don't. <laughs> did have they changed? And this is 1995, I, by the way. This is so 1995. It's even more of a just a regular ass funeral parlor. I specifically have went to funerals in 1995, and that was just the regular funeral parlor. Right. Aesthetic. Right. Like I feel like we don't go to funeral parlor funerals much anymore these days. They tend to just be, uh, in my I've, experience, you know, at different places. You know, usually I outside feel like or something I like that. don't know. I don't go to enough funerals to know that funeral parlor like the current ins and outs of right like, whether this funeral yeah. parlor is in style or out of style yeah you know what yeah exactly maybe we're just lucky enough to know that this is actually a very old-fashioned thing i don't know maybe <laughs> chapter three, <laughs> chapter three. <laughs> marla arrives uh, and she is chubby apparently um yeah she's quirky she's the she's quirky, quirky. She is quirky and she is she's she's thick um, and she's like the overbearing aunt type. Like, yeah, just like, yeah, bah! we she's get basically we Kathy get more... from the comic strip. Kathy, she kind of is. <laughs> she I will say I will say Marla gets a decent amount of description. She's actually the only character that's a character thus far. Right. Right. She has a type, you know, like, she, like yeah. you can follow it. You can follow the, you can, you can you know, like, I like the cut of Marla's jib, you know? I she's, do too. Yes. Um, she's got a shitty younger brother. Uh, oh yeah. God, that kid's a sh- little shit. Um, he's 11, but he's written like he's six. Um, yeah. yeah. as a parent yeah. of a nine year old, I'm like that. None of what this kid does really tracks for me. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I had to double check that cause he's 11. I was like, 11's pretty old for like bitching about not getting to play with your action figures like at a funeral like even the shittiest 11 year old i feel like understands the gravitas of a fucking funeral yeah 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 um so they go back to the diner because who doesn't who loves double beats? This guy. I mean, this that guy last loves him some was, double beats. Oh, that, la- that last that last <laughs> diner scene was fucking on fire. So let's let's go back for round goddamn two. Why not? So we got we're now we're at the diner and we got the two final additions or three final additions to the party. Marla, mm-hmm. her younger brother, Jason and Lamar. Lamar. Um, now, now. Marla, M A R L A, and Lamar, L A M A R, are anagrams of each other. Um, also, now we got a John, a Jason, a Jessica, and a Carlton, and a Charlie. Yep. And, uh, and I Marla personally, and Lamar. I personally have a little rule of thumb when I'm writing that I try not to <laughs> have. Uh, characters share the first le- the same first letter yeah. um i just i just try to avoid it you know good just good yeah. best practice um but we got three characters and then two characters and then we got two another two characters with anagram names yeah no i'm not a fan of the names the way the names are kind of like spell like I don't know. It, it really bugged me as I thought about it more. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get it. Because, you know, when you've got this many characters and the characters aren't really differentiated in a lot of clear ways, uh, you know, you do need some sort of quick touchstone in your brain to fall back on. And if they all have similar names and similar, you know, letters and it just it becomes a mush after a while. They're just not well cut characters to begin with. And right. then you make it that much harder for us to keep track of which one is which. And yeah, I, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the diner scene happens again, except now with Mar- Marla and Lamar. Um, like that's pretty much all that happens is they 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 have a weird conversation about ghosts, which mm-hmm. I guess could be um, it would. 
it could be interesting as a foreshadowing conversation, but it's too long and not really interesting enough to to give it any gravitas. Um, yeah, it's like a Twitter conversation. Yeah. It's like it, you know, like it's it's basically people discussing memories. Are ghosts real? Well, I don't think ghosts are real, but I think memories imprint in the room. Well, that's not what I'm talking about, though. And blah, 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 and just it's this back and forth, and nothing really comes of it. It just kind of peters out. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think if it had been just this kind of pointed moment, uh, it could have been interesting foreshadowing or set the tone, set the mood. Yeah. But instead, it just comes off as this rambly conversation. Yeah. Um. So uh, they re- then they tell Marla and Lamar that they went to Freddy's the night before. Um, and then they go off to the thing. And uh, they get there. It's it's at the I think it was at the football field. Was that it? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. And they're the yeah. parents are. So Michael's parents get up and they do a scholar. These are like the only parents in the entire book. Um, yes. They get up and do. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, they get up and they do a scholarship speech. Um, and then Carlton also gives a speech uh, talking about Michael. Um, sad times all around. Um, it actually comes up that. Michael wasn't the only kid that was killed. There were yeah. like five other kids that were murdered, uh, like in the same way or something like that. Um, yeah, this is the only time we get like, this is like our first bit of fine detail. Uh, yeah. We know he's died uh, uh, probably tragically, you know, uh, but uh, this is this is the first. Yeah, it's just that like he died and some other kids also got snatched. The, the up, Yeah, up until. Bring it up. Up until this point, it it keeps saying everything was great until it happens. Um, yeah. And I, I'm not a fan of, of that, that heavy, like, reliance on. Because you, the narrator is inconsistently bouncing between third person uh, omniscient and uh third person what the fuck's it called when it's uh it's just the character uh or just a standard third person point of view yeah just third person it's basically it basically jumps between charlie's third person point of view or a third person omniscient narrator if you have a third person all-knowing narrator then the all-knowing narrator wouldn't be stopping wouldn't have like an emotional hedge right to say it there's or, no need to or, be and coy. not talk about. It. There's no need to be coy from the narrator's yeah. point, of, point of view. Um, so there's some inconsistency in the way the narration is structured, and this that's like a that's like a tier level down in terms of like critique of this book is like there is some wibbly wobbliness <laughs> in the act, right in the in the straight up narration. Well, and it, it feels it, and it feels like the author is just like it almost feels like the author is basically saying like, well, I, I, there's there's totally uh, a weird thing that happened, and I, you, you just uh, you're gonna have to wait to find yeah. out what it is. Like they're just like trying to come up with it at the top of their yeah, you know, yeah, top uh, of their head. Right. Um, there's another book that I'm reading right now. Um, uh, it, and is a recommendation from Phil. And I mentioned to him, I'm halfway through it. It's a novella. And in the 66 pages that I've read from the, uh, from this novella, more has happened than in the 140 pages that we've read for Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes. Yeah. Um, yet, what I, one of the things, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a first person narration, the story. And the great thing about it is that the way the narr- the narrator works in that is he'll drop a little crumb of detail about something that happens, but then doesn't actually, it's not like he's, he's constantly teasing something that right. happened. It'll just be like offhanded crumb of detail that something that, about something that happened. And then when it's an appropriate moment, that detail will blossom into like a, a full yeah. thing. Um, so, in this instance, the issue I have is that it's this detail keeps being like forced upon us that something happens 
And we're like, we don't need to know more than once with the big neon lights, something happened. Right, right. We're, what we're we need is something time. to pull us along. Yeah, th- there's no time for this after a while. Like, it, for, you give us, if you say, if you say that once, if you say the, when the incident happened in italics, whatever, you know, the incident, you yeah. can do that once. Sure, do that once. That's you shaking a seed out, you know? But then you have to take the next step. You can't just shake more seeds out because it's boring at that point. We need more to pull us along and we're not really getting it. Right. Uh, there isn't, yeah, there isn't much that's pulling us at this point. I don't know how people got through this book because I'm only, I only got this far because we have a fucking show. Yeah, uh, we have a show to do. <laughs> Let's do the show. Let's do the show. <laughs> sure. Hey there, everybody. Hi. Oh, wait, you, you <laughs> oh fuck. Sorry. Um, yeah. Sorry. Not um, off for a second. So uh, it's sad times. Uh, John and Charlie go off to her old house to soak in some more nostalgia. Um, these are and, some nostalgic uh, 17 year olds. These are some nostalgic 17 year olds for the I age can't of trust seven. That. Like yeah, you've you've gotten like imagine imagine like a character from like Napoleon Dynamite the 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 uncle uh, the uncle who's like the, all he does is talk about his high school football career and everything like that and he's yeah. in his forties or fifties at that point you know so it's like that's a pretty well worn trope we're talking about seventeen year olds who are getting misty eyed uh, over the good old days and shit like they these people are doomed yeah yeah too much nostalgia too soon. Oh, um, it's bad. So they they talk about how they had their first kiss together at the age of six. Didn't uh, like that scene. Um, I guess. Yeah, that was that was not <laughs> a comfortable scene. <laughs> um, and I mean, like it was like, I guess, you know, kids being kids or whatever, but also oh, six, sure. it feels weird. Um, as the, so they finally go into her dad's workshop and she has a memory of her dad showing her the animatronics and how like the how one of them, uh, Bonnie, has like a jaw that would snap shut. And he's like, don't touch it. It'll bite your fingers off. And they're like, dude, you are terrible at this shit. Yeah. <laughs> you're, a, um, you're a very bad father. You are a very bad father and animatronic maker. Um, right. <laughs> it's true. You're a... Not good. Um, so yeah. they talk about the day that Michael went missing. And earlier in one of the chapters, Charlie misremembered uh, Freddie as having yellow fur. And yeah. that stirs a memory in John saying, you know, uh, the day Michael went missing, I remember seeing a guy in a yellow mascot suit standing by the table next to Michael. Uh, and the suit had yellow fur. And it's kind of like a dun dun dun, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. piecing a couple things together, um, which is great. I mean, that's that's yes. a fun. More of that, please, please. For God's more, sake, more of that. Yeah, for God's sake, <laughs> more the, of that. Move the mystery forward, please. Move, uh, yes, no, we are in no chapter more three. diner scenes. <laughs> we are a hundred pages into the book. Yeah. Give me a little something. Yeah. Uh, chapter four, uh, they finally call it a ducking mall is what my autocorrected <laughs> notes say. <laughs> Good to know that still happens. <laughs> um, and uh, the party, so the party retraces their steps from the previous night. Um, they, the security guard thing happens again uh, because Double beats are us. Um, is is this book? We're, we gotta we gotta hit the same. We gotta do it, and then we're gonna do it again. Um, Absolutely. So Lamar then says that community service is worse than being shot. And yeah. I, I, after that, I, that I wrote right wing propaganda. Um, <laughs> He, for context, he's telling the little they they they've, they're bringing this eleven year old slash six year old. Uh, along with them <laughs> to break into this mall and the kid's afraid of the security guard and I guess as a way of making a joke uh, the kid says well when we get shot and the guy says worse community service uh, which yuck 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 
It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty toothless stuff, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Edge lords over here. Um, so they uh, they get in there and uh, they're exploring. They're walking around. They find a room behind the stage, um, and it's the it seems to be the room that is that controlled the animatronics, like the yeah. the programming room where they would program the dance moves. Like there's a button for each like pose for the robots, and you could like program those in for the for uh, uh, the performances. Um, some of the people hear the, the music again. Um, there's an, a legitimately creepy scene, a uh, moment. The only one so far where mm. Jason finds a, a drawing of a kid hugging Bonnie. And he's very interested in it. And he goes to the wall and he takes it off the wall. And he looks away for a moment. And then when he looks back at the drawing, now the drawing is of a kid running away from Bonnie and Bonnie is chasing him. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's that's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. 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 Pretty cool. (coughs) I like it. More of that, please. Yeah, sure. Um, So, uh, meanwhile, John and Charlie are playing hide and seek. Um, Because, Okay. Uh, the rest of them it's find a random ass scene. They just like decide they're gonna play hide and go seek in this restaurant that this dilapidated restaurant. Of... Yeah, the last That's... place their old friend was seen alive. Childhood, yeah. childhood. <laughs> ba ba da ba da bum. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the rest of them go find the security room, which is gives is described as being very much like, hey, it's the security room from the game. Right. Um, right. Or something along those lines. Um, and as they're playing around with the dials, they start hearing like a creepy voice or something on the static. There's there's something going on with the static. Mm-hmm. Um, Charlie, meanwhile, thinks she's found a great hiding spot. She's behind a curtain. And wouldn't you know it, holy shit, she forgot. She's behind the curtain and she's standing next to Foxy. Um, Mm -hmm. And she starts to leave when the hook from Foxy's hand comes down and slashes Charlie's arm. And she falls out. John catches her. um, And everybody runs out. And they're like, oh, shit, sorry. That was probably us. We were pressing buttons in the security room. And that was like, we probably activated foxy's like pose thing or maybe they didn't i don't know maybe um maybe ghosts um anyway <laughs> maybe Foxy, ghosts <laughs> foxy's uh irresponsibly sharp claw uh, <laughs> design flaw number one uh, <laughs> god damn it <laughs> this irresponsibly charlie, sharp claw your dad um, sucks charlie god damn it charlie what the fuck was your dad thinking um um, yeah, the claw slices Charlie's arm and, uh, that's, they basically, they're like, all right, well, we got to go. And that's the second <laughs> night at Freddy's. That's the second night. They leave. They leave. They leave. They leave again. And, leave. um, and Marla and, uh, takes, uh, Charlie to a, uh, a 24 hour, pharmacy and get some stuff to bandage her up and they have a deep oh, yeah. conversation about how like the only reason jason is there is because marla's parents or jason's parents and marla's it's mom like and jason's stepdad. dad and her yeah, they're, mom they're half their mom. siblings something like that uh, yeah. but anyway they're 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 arguing all the time they're probably getting divorced and and all that stuff and you know, Marla, the MVP of the characterization race, um, just constantly lapping everybody else and things like right. having things, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the real I mean, the real thing to I be mean, afraid of yeah, is divorce. So. It's divorce. <laughs> That's the real thing. We don't I, need I to forgot worry about to it. mention Lamar does have uh, is a, a great ahead of everybody and is going to. Uh, is going to college uh, mm-hmm. the next year. Um, so that's... So, I mean, that's got about something. as fleshed out as it gets, right? That's Yeah. 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 We all him. know that guy. 
John writes, uh, he's Bukowski in training. Carlton yep. is local. Yeah. Don't know what else we can do with that. Jessica's the pretty. Pretty, yep, pretty but nice. Pretty but nice. Uh, Lamar is smart. Mm-hmm. Um, he skipped a grade. And uh, John doesn't like that. He's yeah, oh, a little bit of jealousy. intimidated by it. He's intimidated by it. Um, Jason is 11 but 6. Oh, Jason's 11 but 6. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Marla is... Um, Marla is the the chubby girl uh, from the Kathy comic strip, um, and she has a lot of emotions. Yeah. Uh, and her parent her parents are getting divorced. So, so and they've spent two nights at Freddy's. Two nights at Freddy's. All right. So are they going to do? Are do you think they're going to do five nights at Freddy's? Uh, <sighs> They have to, don't they? I mean, they've committed at this point. It would be they've kind committed of, to the bit, kind of wasteful. It, it, but just just a, a, a quick roundup of all of our threats. We are 140 pages into this book. We are a third of the way through the book. This is a very long book for FNAF. It's almost 400 pages long. Uh, our threats after one third of the book is up. <clears throat> uh, aside from Flash forwards and flashbacks with, you know, memories of robots. Um, one accidental question mark slash from the poorly designed Foxy. Uh, a spooky, admittedly spooky drawing of Bonnie. Uh, two instances of music box slash voices and two instances of security guard who is will just remain nameless, I suppose. Yeah. So, look, we can we can build up tension, uh, but we're talking about a book based on a game with killer animatronic bears and rabbits and shit. Uh, someone should have died by now. The only death we've got is someone who died ten years ago. Yeah, we. This is. It's just. If I were, here's the thing. We we immediately apologized to anybody who was a fan of Five Nights at Freddy's, and we, we were pretty upfront with the fact that we are not impressed with this book. If I were a fan of five, like a huge super fan of Five Nights at Freddy's, and I read this this deep into it, and no one had died, and no one had really been in any level of real danger at all, a third of the way, to, I'd be pissed. Like yeah. I feel cheated. So yeah. I I don't know what the fuck is going on here. I I this so I'm bored to my, out of my fucking tits right now. Yeah, <laughs> that's the that's the thing. Is somebody asked me? Um, one of, one of my friends asked me when I was complaining about it on a Discord. Like, oh, is it like bad? You know, in a way that's fun, or and I said, no, it's it's worse. It's boring. It's boring. It's a drag, uh, man. It's a, it is a drag. Um and that's I feel like I feel like bad is one thing. And yeah. I don't even like calling things bad necessarily cuz I think it's like it's usually just like a it, it's an inarticulate criticism. Yeah. Um I yeah. to me on my cardinal sins is like the worst thing something can be is boring. Yeah. Like Yeah. I don't I don't think that that's necessarily going to be a valuable emotion to evoke in somebody is boredom. Um. If, if, if you and I went to see a movie or something yeah. like that and we hated it, just straight up hated it and went to a diner afterwards and ate scrambled eggs until two in the morning talking about how stupid we thought the movie was, that would still be something because the movie got us to talk about how bad we thought it was. It's suggesting then that the movie made some choices and maybe right. what it comes down to is we just didn't agree with those choices. Right. With this, it I don't really know, saps I, the energy out of it. It really does. Yeah. Now, you you're you're a, a chapter ahead of me. Like you kept yeah. reading after this. Yeah, I, I kept reading. I forgot how far we were going into it, but I yeah, I, I read chapter five, and um, 
my my spoiler free review of chapter five is like, oh, okay. Well, okay. Okay. There's things there's things that hey, happen I'll take things. that are more interesting. Like the book probably could have fucking started with chapter five if you did oh, uh, some life rewriting. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. There it's must like, have been. It's not like it throws it's not like it throws continuity out or anything like that. I'm just like, no. oh, it, I mean, if you throw out the first 130 pages and just start here with uh, some some tweaking to the setup, I It's like probably a JRPG. <laughs> Like a JRPG it doesn't get good like, until 60 hours in. <laughs> yeah, man. When you when you get past that 30 hour mark, boom, starts picking up. Picking up. Persona 6 is gonna be amazing. Oh god. Persona. Uh, so yeah, I, I you know, we talked about it earlier. You know, say what you want about FNAF as a game, you know, it, people some people think it's just kind of a cheap, stupid thrill ride you know and and some people are super into it say what you want about it the game itself has no fat it is lean yeah. it is mean it gets you get right into it and you know what this game is about immediately uh now you can get into that lore if you want to get into it and there's plenty of fat to chew with that but that's totally different uh this book right now feels like nothing but fat. <laughs> yeah. Just... Yeah. It, it doesn't even necessarily feel like it's super strong on the lore front either. No. Uh, other than no. some, it's like really long, ponderous chapters connecting some loose bits together. You get um, kind of a Golden Freddy reference a couple of times. Yeah, the Golden Freddy reference and... and um, yeah, I don't know. And the dates yeah. are weird because... You know, the, I, I don't really feel like getting into Five Nights at Freddy's lore, but <laughs> no, the, the, no, that's not our little, job. That's, that's not, not our, our job. job. <laughs> the very little I know about the FNAF lore is like, oh, but I thought the thing that was bad was 87 and this is 1985 right. and I, uh, this is 95 and OK. Um, OK. So yeah, there's like a whole bunch of things that I I'm just choosing to ignore otherwise uh, yeah. because it's who uh, I mean, my new opinion is I don't really care about your canon. Um, <laughs> I, that's fair, man. <laughs> uh, like continuity is just a lie. We tell ourselves. Uh, <laughs> well, man, it's like it's like if 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 this book was meant to be. If this book is meant to be supplementary, specific to the games, then we need to be told something. We need to be given something here. Uh, because if you're just interested and you pick this up and, and, and find out later that it's like, oh, well, to get what's going on in here fully, you really need to play Five Nights at Freddy's 1 through 6 or whatever in this order and all that. It's just more bullshit at that point. And the continuity, the canon... I, I don't I don't give a shit if I can't just enjoy a piece of it by itself, you know. Like you can right. you can pick up at any of the Five Nights at Freddy's games. Well, mostly uh, any of the Five Nights at Freddy's games, uh, and just have a scary, fun, good time if you're into those kinds of games, and never know uh, about the lore. And I think that's one of the values in that game. Uh, and and unless something changes quick here with this book, I'm starting to feel like it, this this might not be the case with this one. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see we'll how see. the next next set of chapters uh, feel in our eyeballs. Um, <laughs> so, so Phil, I know your computer is uh, is still on the mend, um, but you, you you mentioned you you broke out some some consoles. Yeah, so I am I am legally and contractually obligated to ask you of course what are you playing <laughs> uh i i busted out the ps4 uh i actually uh last week when i was hit with the the the, the joys of uh covid uh i uh actually did a thing that's never happened to me on Twitter before. I did one of those survey things where like you have 30 questions and I'll give you an answer for every like I get and everything. And I've done those before, but this is the first time that I got enough likes to finish the whole thing, uh, which is new. Uh, <laughs> and it was all about video games and stuff. And that was super fun. 
And one of the things that it asked about was, what's a game that you haven't played but you should? And I talked about how one of my big blind spots in gaming was uh, uh, Metal Gear Solid, uh, which I've never played any of those games. And I forgot that outside of that, another huge blind spot for me, which is embarrassing because I own most of the games and I've just never played them, was Uncharted. Mm. And uh, so I powered up the PS4 and my PS4 years ago when I got it came with the Nathan Drake collection, which I never got around to playing with. And uh, and I said, you know, I've seen the damn movie. Uh, I know this series. I'm sorry. And frankly, when the <laughs> what's that? I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I liked it. I thought it was good. Okay. I thought it was fun. <laughs> but then again, I, I find uh, I find Tom, Tom Holland to be just effortlessly charming. He's, I, he's I, so I, adorable, isn't he? He's you want to put him in your pocket. He's so you just cute. right in your slide him right into your pocket. Just put even him with the presence of where... Marky, even with Marky Mark present, yeah. you know, it still <laughs> didn't. Still... You know, <laughs> I don't I I don't know if he was the right choice to play Nathan Drake at this point, but he's adorable and I'll watch him do whatever. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I so I, I I started playing it and, and it was one of those things where when the reboot of Tomb Raider came out around 2013, I want to say 2012, mm-hmm. something like that. The Crystal uh, Dynamics. I, uh, yeah, Crystal Ida's Dynamics. One. Yeah, yeah. I loved those games. I really, uh, the first one especially, but I really enjoyed the other two as well. And when I would tell people that, they go, oh, so you liked Uncharted? And I'm like, actually, I haven't played Uncharted. And they're like, oh, well, you've got to play Uncharted. Um, and I, I'm starting to see what they mean. I'm about two or three hours into the first one. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I love the spectacle. I love uh, the adventure, the climbing. The, the, the controls start to get on my nerves from time to time. I've always had a problem with Naughty Dog controls. Um, but, uh, it's just really enjoyable. It's just that kind of big damn action adventure fun, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ludo narrative dissonance be damned. Uh, (laughs) it's, it's a great time. Uh, and I'm definitely going to wrap at least the first one up. Uh, you know, I, this was the year that I finally got around to playing the, uh, 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 Dead Space trilogy, so why not get into Uncharted yeah, as well? Just dust off some classics, you know. Exactly. Just get them off the backlog. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm playing. I'm really enjoying it. So yeah, that's good. Me. So what? Good. What about you, Kevin? What are you playing, dude? Uh, I am playing um, Weird West still. Okay. Um, and it's great. I love it. Um, I'm also playing. I have a I have a special uh, hidden secret project that I'm working on with someone that I cannot divulge quite yet. Ooh, um, but I've been playing first? through. What's that? I said you heard it here first. Question mark? <laughs> you heard? I don't know. What did he, you hear? he might have. I, he might have announced it between the the time we're recording this and the time it comes out. So I'm not gonna. Um, I'm not going to spoil that announcement, Uh, but if he announced it, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, So I've been (laughs) playing uh, through the uh, Heretic and Hexen series. Um, Yeah, some those are some classics. Um, Hexen 2. How are they holding up? Hexen 2 is really neat. Um, It is... um, You look at Hexen 2, which runs on the Quake engine... Uh, or the id tech engine that they used for quake um and it is uh it's a really interesting game because it has a lot of like immersive sim elements as well as some elements that you would find in like a metroidvania or a dark souls or something like that there's a lot of like backtracking and opening shortcuts and things like that in Hexen 2. Um, it also doesn't have any like lives or anything like that. It, mm-hmm. There's like a lot of little checkpoints. So if you die, it just like boots you back to the beginning of like the area that you were just in. Um, it's neat. It's a neat game. Um, and and uh, I've been I've been enjoying my playthrough of it uh, so far. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good stuff, and I put. I've been putting in way too many hours in Weird West, like too many, I, too many hours. I gotta, I, I've, I've got to play that game. I was looking. I, at, at, the, at, at, at this point, I'm just like, uh, I've realized that the main quest doesn't have like a timer, so I'm just oh. like, oh, well, I'm just gonna fuck around the map. Then Side I'm just gonna go to. I'm just gonna, 
I'm just going to go to towns and see what's going on and, oh, yeah. and talk to people and see if they have, can they, can they give me a side quest? Uh, yeah, I'll do, I'll go kill that dude for a hundred dollars. Sure. No Hell doubt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. So that's what I'm playing, uh, uh, as of, as of right now. Sweet. Yeah. So, uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. We we actually made it through in a, 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 a it FNAF hasn't broken us episode. Yet. It hasn't broken yeah. us yet. Um, if <laughs> if you want to help us out, uh, follow us on Twitter you. and Instagram. Our handle on both is PixelitPod. Uh, visit our webpage at pixelitpod.com. From there, there are links to our Discord and to our Steam Curator page, where you can see reviews of uh, the games we talk about in the What Are You Playing segment. Uh, yes. If you have the means and the wherewithal, please rate us five stars on iTunes, Spotify, Good Pods, or wherever you're listening and has a rating system. Um, and otherwise, have a good evening. Bye.